Hello. I'm Dr. Ji Dae Kyung, the director of Seoul May Orthodontic Dental Clinic. Today, I'm here to give the second lecture in our Clear Aligner Master course, focusing on biomechanics of clear aligners, which might seem a bit challenging. I'll try to focus on simple but essential things in this lecture as much as possible. First, I'll be covering the topics of attachments and various considerations related to the application of orthodontic forces, and finally, we'll discuss anchorage in orthodontics. By the way, how many Avatar movies have been released so far? Three, right? Well, this may show my age. In the first Avatar movie, there was a line that left a strong impression on me, I see you. It doesn't just mean looking at someone, it means truly understanding them at the deepest level. Biomechanics can be quite challenging. You might feel unfamiliar with clear aligners at first. However, let's move forward together with the spirit of ICU with love and patience. In the previous lecture, I explained the concept of pulling and pushing forces in clear aligner treatment, how orthodontic forces are applied in clear aligners, and how these forces are applied in traditional braces. I also explained the advantages and disadvantages of the tooth movements. Now, to make things simpler, let me give you an example. Here's an extraction case. Both the upper and lower first premolars have been extracted. In traditional bracket system, a full-size rectangular stainless steel wires are used, along with power chains or nickel titanium coil springs to pull these teeth to the desired positions. They are very strong but smooth wires, which means there are no particular problems during the treatment. However, in the extraction case, when we attempt to move teeth mesially and distally using clear aligners, what kinds of tooth movements do you think occur? This type of force tends to result in what's known as bowing effect, something we also need to be cautious about in bracket systems. Now, this is just one example. To prevent undesirable tooth movements and achieve more effective movements, attachments were introduced. I will explain this later. By increasing the active surface, the area where orthodontic forces are applied, we can effectively control the direction of tooth movements. That's why attachments have become essential in overcoming the limitations of clear aligner treatments and achieving desirable tooth movements. In the early stages, attachments were placed on tilted teeth to generate moments to shift the teeth. Attachments were used in this way. As I've emphasized before, traditional bracket systems rely on both pulling and pushing forces to move teeth. In contrast, clear aligner systems use a different force-driven system. This system enables more effective tooth movements by applying greater forces where necessary and lighter forces where less movement is required. So, the first topic I'd like to cover today is the key considerations in attachment design, specifically the active surface. I'll explain some factors such as the direction, position, and size of the active surface, which is the area where orthodontic forces are applied. The active surface refers to the area where pushing forces are applied to the tooth. When orthodontic force is applied to an active surface, it generates an extrusive force. The direction of the force is determined by the degree of mismatch, as well as the orientation of the active surface. For example, if a hemispherical attachment is placed on a tooth like this, extrusive force is applied by the vector sum of the forces. The second factor is the position of the attachment. Now, I'm going to give you two quizzes. If you write down your answers in the Q&A section, we'll hold a random drawing and send a prize to the winners. We are trying to achieve mesiolingual rotation of a tooth. Between the two images, which one do you think would more efficiently produce the desired mesiolingual rotation? One, two, three. I hope you all got the answer right. Now, here's the second question. 
We are trying to achieve palatal expansion by inducing buccal tipping from the inside using an aligner. Of course, there are anatomical limitations. When we try to expand the arch, buccal tilting tends to occur. So, which approach would be more effective in preventing this? One, two, three. This option would be more effective. By placing an attachment on the buckle side, we can effectively prevent excessive buckle tilting. If you look at some studies, you'll find that attachments can be placed in various positions, sizes, and orientations depending on the desired tooth movement. I recommend you to take a look at these papers. They can be quite helpful. To summarize it, for horizontal movements, long type vertical attachments are effective. And for vertical movements, long type horizontal attachments are helpful. Now, let's talk about the size of attachments. The smaller the attachment, the better it is in terms of comfort and aesthetics. However, when the attachments are too small, the surface area exposed to occlusal force also decreases, which may reduce its functionality. In clinical practice, we often talk about optimized attachments and conventional attachments. They are slightly smaller and more rounded in shape. You can choose between the two attachments. Personally, when planning cases that require more significant tooth movements, I tend to prefer using conventional attachments. This can be chosen depending on each clinician's preference. Now, speaking of the functions of attachments, as we've discussed before, they help provide retention to ensure proper seating of the aligner and they also act as a way to prevent slipping since aligners primarily apply pushing forces. In addition, they ensure that a full force vector is transmitted for efficient tooth movement. Let's take a closer look. Now, when we place a class 2 elastic, there is always a risk that the aligner may become loose. To prevent this, we use attachments to enhance the retention of aligners. Ideally, although not always necessary, the attachment should be placed closer to gingival margin and inclined toward the occlusal surface. This placement allows the attachment to fully serve its role in providing proper retention. The second point is essentially the same. To prevent slipping and to ensure that force vector is properly transmitted, we need to use attachments to utilize rotational force. As mentioned in the previous lecture, in this case, the aligners would slip without attachments. By transmitting forces through active surface, we can prevent slipping and achieve more effective tooth rotation. Now let me share my personal experience. I had a case where the tooth movement was progressing well, and I provided the patient with six aligners at once. And later the patient returned after wearing the sixth aligner, and when I checked, the aligner wasn't seating properly on the teeth, indicating that traction was not effectively achieved. The teeth were not moving as intended. It turned into quite a situation. We had to call Magic Align, and we even held a meeting at the clinic to figure out what went wrong. It turned out there was a hidden attachment to solve the issues such as vertical movement, transverse expansion, and distal out rotation. But I had missed it. As a result, after other teeth moved as planned, the aligner ended up becoming loose in this area. This was clearly a clinician's mistake, one that reminds us how important it is to carefully review the attachments. As you can see, a misfit between the aligner and teeth can be caused by several reasons including localized pressure, poor patient cooperation, and clinician's errors as mentioned earlier. That is why it is crucial to check for these issues at every patient's visit. Now when it comes to applying orthodontic forces, there are three major considerations. Each of these could take an hour to fully explore, but for today, I'll go over just one key point from each category. The three major considerations are attachments, pressure areas, and intraoral elastics. Even when using attachments in bracket systems, controlling root movement is not easy. 
In clear aligner treatment, attachments allow us to effectively control root movement using moment forces. This is the pattern of tooth movement induced by the application of orthodontic forces using aligners. There was an experiment comparing tooth movement with and without attachments. The results showed that when attachments were applied, specifically, anti-tipping attachments designed to generate moments to promote root movement, the bodily movement occurred. It's something that makes sense at a glance. Now, let's move on to pressure areas. In traditional orthodontics, when we want to induce tipping or apply torque to a tooth, we use a TMA rectangular wire inserted into the small bracket slot. For this case, a torque spring can be also used. Theoretically, it's not easy to apply appropriate torque with clear aligners either. However, in theory, by using power ridges or lengthening the moment arm, it is possible to achieve more efficient torque movement with less force. So in that sense, this can be an advantage of the system. Now, finally, let's move on to the topic of intraoral elastics. They are common in bracket system too. As for the force and length, usually, for example, with the denominator of 16 and the numerator being 2, 3, 4, 5 thus, 1 8th, 3 16th, 1 4th, and 5 16th in length, and the force of 4 to 4.5 ounces. They are selected as needed in each case. Next, I'd like to briefly explain the application points or surfaces. In a typical class 2 simulation, the class 2 elastic is applied like this. When using aligners, the elastics can be attached using buttons. In some cases, we also create a precision cut, which is a hook-like cut on the aligner. Today, I'd like to explain the key features of this. Firstly, let's look at this. Well, several types of tooth movement will be discussed in the next and following sessions. In this case, we are trying to achieve distalization of the posterior teeth. As you saw earlier, during this process, a button is placed on the upper canine to apply a class 2 elastic. In this case, I also used a hook-like precision cut on the aligner, which allowed more effective distalization. From an occlusal view, we can compare using a hook on the upper canine versus using a precision cut on the aligner when applying class 2 elastics. In the latter case, more effective tooth movement is observed. Personally, I prefer using precision cuts, but in certain cases with procline canines and mesial in rotation, I may choose to place a button on the canine instead. However, when using a button on the canine, you need to be cautious about distal and rotation of canines. Now, finally, let's move on to the topic of anchorage. Anchorage is often the most challenging, yet one of the most important part of orthodontic treatment. Generally, whether we are pulling or pushing, the law of action and reaction is always applied. But when we drop an anchor, it stabilizes the boat, allowing us to pull the other side. The anchorage ratio, whether it's 6 to 4 or 7 to 3, is a critical part of what we call anchorage preparation in orthodontics. In general, action and reaction forces are involved in every tooth movement. In the diagnostic phase, we need to define how to control and prevent unwanted movement of the teeth. For example, in extraction cases, anchorage is classified into three categories, moderate, maximum, and minimum. In the case where the first premolars are extracted, the typical anchorage ratio might be 6 to 4, 7 to 3, or 5 to 5 for the intended movement. 
When the second premolars are extracted, the four posterior teeth and eight anterior teeth are moved, producing greater movement from the posterior region. In such cases, this is referred to as minimum anchorage, and screws are also placed. In this case, the posterior teeth act as a single unit, allowing the entire anterior teeth to be moved distally. This situation is referred to as maximum anchorage, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. So in bracket systems, when we move teeth, we apply protraction forces to the posterior teeth with moderate anchorage. For cases with maximum anchorage, especially when using screws, we aim to prevent anchorage loss of the posterior teeth. These processes are what we refer to as anchorage preparation. Now, I know this may be a little complex, but I'll explain it step by step during later sessions, such as session 4 and session 6. Take a moment to think about it. Before we apply class 2 elastic, the goal is to distalize the posterior teeth. In a class 2 case, when we try to move the posterior teeth, as mentioned earlier, this naturally causes action and reaction forces. Then what happens to the anterior teeth? You'll see that they begin to move forward, because when you push on them, they may reactively move. Therefore, by applying class 2 elastics in this way to control the forward movement of the teeth, we can effectively achieve distalization of the maxillary dentition. This demonstrates finite element analysis of anchorage management. I know it is not easy. Earlier, I mentioned the line I see you from Avatar, and just like that, I will share with you how I've come to understand clear aligner treatment. Over the next 20 sessions, I'll be passing on to you everything I know about clear aligners. If you stay with me, I promise to support you every step of the way. Thank you.